My name is Jen Thompson. I lead our new brand strategy and propositions for YouTube across North and Central Europe. Um, and my colleague Steve gave a nice little introduction earlier this morning about the power of the YouTube viewer through the lens of one of our YouTube creators, Tanya Burr. And I will dive a little bit deeper this afternoon into um, the discussion of that YouTube viewer. Uh, before I do that, though, I'm going to start a little bit high level with answering the question, what is YouTube? And pop, uh, popular to YouTube, we will start with a video. You can see this way. There we go. Jack and my name is Phil. We've hit 2 million subscribers. My first YouTube video. My channel has hit 1 million subscribers. What is YouTube? This year, YouTube turned nine, nine years old. And uh, over the course of that nine years, you can see through the video that it has evolved to represent many different things. It is firsthand news coverage, it is last night's sports highlights, it is inspiration for tomorrow's dinner, um, it is beauty tips, it is community, it is sharing, it is streaming of music and celebrating festival season. Um, YouTube has come to represent many, many things, but when I talk about YouTube, I like to emphasize one, and that is YouTube's purpose. YouTube's purpose is to fuel people's passions. That is something that we have always done. And when someone is passionate about something, when they really love something, they want to talk about it, and they want to share that experience, make a video of it. And they want to connect with a community that also shares that similar passion. It's actually a pretty good reason for me to get out of bed in the morning. It provides a little bit of emotional connection to my day-to-day -day job. Um, knowing that working on a platform, we're not just creating entertainment for a viewer's eyeballs, but we're uh, creating a way for them to connect through their hearts. Those passions range across a broad, uh, a wide range of uh, spectrum. From mainstream passions, I mentioned sports and music and fashion, uh, to much more niche passions. So we heard in the talk just before me about learning to play the guitar. I happen to be learning to play the ukulele. I suck at it right now, um, but there's a lot of YouTube content for me to discover a brand new passion and teach me new chords uh, so I can finally play the Beatles, Here Comes the Sun. Um, so all these niche passions would not be possible without our YouTube creator community. Uh, we have over one million YouTube creators across 30 countries on YouTube. And these range from your backyard Spielbergs to your mainstream movie production studios, uh, the likes of fashion and beauty vloggers like Tanya Burr and Zoella, uh, to your mainstream uh, beauty companies. And we'll hear just after me a panel of some of our YouTube creators, and all of them are pursuing a different passion and purpose with their uh, audience base. Uh, but one thing is a common thread as these uh, YouTube creators develop their business. And that is that our YouTube creators have discovered that building a fan base will supercharge their business. Building a fan base will supercharge their business. Notice I didn't say audience. So what is the difference between an audience and a fan base? 
Audiences are told when to tune in. A fan base watches when they want to. An audience might uh, change the channel when their show is done, and a fan base will comment and share, curate. An audience will sit back and absorb content where a fan base will lean forward and participate. Uh, and an audience is generally bound by the borders in which they live, where a fan base isn't bound by those same borders. So contrary to what uh, the agenda today shows, I'm not going to talk to you about the YouTube audience, I'm going to talk with you about YouTube fans. And I will share with you four ways that through uh, video and YouTube that fans are starting to shape media. Uh, so there's been a lot of discussion this year about the competition in late night TV in the Americas. Uh, generally, this has been a competition between Jay Leno and David Letterman, uh, two guys on two separate networks, one time slot. And then you have these guys. You've got Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, uh, and Conan O'Brien. And these guys know that the, uh, the late night viewership audience is at a peak. They know that through the introduction of uh, cable TV, video, or on-demand TV, and online video, that the competition isn't just among them, those three. It's across every form of entertainment that people can consume. And so they know in order to be successful, they need to find new audiences. They need to find new viewers that potentially aren't sitting on their couches at, during late night ready to watch at a certain time slot. And so they have turned to YouTube to do this um, by creating videos that their viewers like to consume, videos that are shareable, videos that they can watch on the go. And it's working. So we have Jimmy Fallon, who uh, earlier this year took over for Jay Leno as the host of The Tonight Show. And on his debut of the host of the show, he had 10 million uh, people tuned in. 10 million. The views on that same show on YouTube were double that, 20 million. And over the course of two weeks, the first two weeks of him being the host, he had over 90 million views on his YouTube videos, uh, sometimes in one day peaking 10 million. And that is due to clips like this. I'm not gonna stand up and rap for you, but uh, I'll move on to Conan O'Brien. So Conan O'Brien, he has over 3,000 videos on YouTube, uh, over half a billion views. And then uh, Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Kimmel gets it. Jimmy Kimmel loves a good prank. He has done Oscar pranks, he's done Olympic pranks, he's done twerking pranks. Um, over the past three years, he's gotten over 108 million views on a challenge that he has given to parents to film their children realizing, or when their parents have showcased that they accidentally ate their Halloween candy. 108 million views. That is 16 times the number that he would get in an episode. Uh, now Jimmy Kimmel, uh, earlier this year, he had launched an initiative, hashtag Kimmel YouTube Film. Uh, hashtag Kimmel YouTube film where he had started to do a mashup between these iconic classic Hollywood clips uh, and YouTube memes. And I'm gonna show you a quick clip of Bitman Begins. Doesn't have to be like this. I trusted you. 
I was only a child. You were an animal. Look at my hand. You stay back. Oh, God, have mercy on what I might do to you. Mercy? <laughs> you hear that, God? He wants mercy after what he did. Charlie bit me! Charlie bit my finger! Oh, Charlie, that really hurt. <laughs> Uh, so Jimmy Kimmel has over 4 million uh, fans on YouTube and over 1 billion views. Um, and we know through our research with Nielsen that when a show's, when YouTube consumption of a show goes up, so does its TV ratings. Uh, YouTube and TV are very, very complementary. And what we see from what these three gentlemen represent is our first lesson that uh, fan, how fans are shaping media. And that is fans ignore time slots. Fans watch what they want when they want to. So as long as we create content that is memorable and shareable, um, we are on the start of building our brands. Now Ellen DeGeneres takes a little bit different approach with her show. Ellen seeks out the great talent that she finds in these popular YouTube clips and then invites that talent to come onto her show. Ellen is a really great example of celebrating water cooler moments. Um, I'm going to show you a quick clip. She, uh, she discovered uh, Sophia Grace and Rosie in 2011, and I'm gonna show you a clip of their uh, first time visiting Ellen on The Ellen Show. Well, hello, you two. How are you? Okay. Good, I'm glad. <laughs> so, yeah. First time on TV? Yeah. yeah. Are you nervous? No. No? You're, ex you're excited? Yeah. It's very, it, it's nice to meet you. And you are Sophia, right? Yeah. Do I call you Sophia? Yeah. Sophia Grace? You can call me Sophia Grace. Sophia Grace? Yeah. All right, I will. And you are Rosie? Yeah. Hi, Rosie. <laughs> Rosie, you're five? Yeah. And Sophia Grace, you're? Eight. Eight. All right, I heard you do an, uh, an American <coughs> accent. Yeah. Can I hear it? Okay. Hey, Sophia. Hey, Rosie. I can't believe I'm on the Ellen Show. <laughs> Not too bad. <laughs> so, that was very good. That was very good. I do an English accent. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so... Uh, these two girls have been on the Ellen Show 50 times now. And Ellen is a really great representation of the second way in which fans are shaping media. If I can click. And that fans become talent. Uh, so she's had these two girls on the Ellen Show for 50 times now. And they are so popular with both TV audiences and YouTube audiences that Ellen announced that she will be starting a new show just for them. Uh, Ellen's fans, I think it's just under 9 million, 8.9 million fans are a huge inspiration to her TV show um, and some of them even, as we saw, become talent. Uh, now some of you might have heard of a popular YouTube trend called uh, fan tribute videos, fan tribute videos or fan tribute songs. Um, Frozen is the most... Uh, one of the most, if not the most successful uh, movie release of this year. And um, Frozen is Disney's highest grossing original animated film to date. It's higher than The Lion King and higher than, the toy, and than toy Story. But when Frozen was initially released, um, in the first week it was number two on the box office charts. And then the second week came around and it rose to number one. It was top of the box office charts. And then for three weeks in a row, it fell from first place. And then after six weeks, it raised back to lead the box office charts again. Now, for a movie to reclaim the number one position in the box office must have something very special, staying power. So there are many variables that we could attribute to why uh, Frozen might have reclaimed the number one position. It is a great film. 
Uh, but one variable that's very important is Disney's decision to allow fans to express their passion. Um, the, immediately, as soon as we saw Frozen uh, released, we immediately saw an influx of videos of um, renditions of their Oscar-winning song, Let It Go, uploaded onto YouTube. Um, I'm going to play you a short, a short clip of an example of one of my favorite renditions. There are any parents in the audience, I'm sure you can recite that song by heart by now. Um, this, uh, so that video, which was created in the UK, has generated over 30 million views. And outside of the US, surprisingly, the next two countries with the next highest viewership are South Korea and the Philippines. Now, Disney could have made the decision to claim copyright on this video and all of the other videos that were created with different renditions of Let It Go to have them taken down off YouTube. But they didn't. They made a very fan-friendly choice. And the fact that Disney allowed their fans to view these videos, to share these videos, they allowed the fans to create a community around the movie and the passion that they love. And it is with this that Frozen teaches us the third way in which fans have uh, shaped the face of media and that is fans pay tribute. Now any company, any, uh, any company, any brand, any YouTube creator can make the same decision that Disney did and the fact that if you allow your fans to pay tribute, it will build your brand through their passion. Allow your fans to pay tribute, it will build your band, brand through their passions. Um, Sixty percent of the views of our YouTube creators are outside of the country in which they're based. And for some YouTube creators, it's more than that. Um, so for Rob Nixon, he sees 15 times the viewership outside of Australia, which is where he is based. And for British creators, Jack Scapp, they see over 80 percent of their views outside of the UK. And for um, the Spanish channel, oh gosh, I just forgot this channel's name. Uh, for this Spanish channel, she sees uh, over 73% of her views coming out of Spain, which is where she is based. It's a DIY home improvement channel. YouTube has allowed people to stay in touch with their culture. Uh, it's how 25 million non-resident Indians are able to access their favorite Bollywood films or how an American expat living in London can continue to be entertained by her favorite late night host, Rat Battles. Uh, YouTube is global, which brings us to this guy. Uh, I'm not going to talk about his song, though two million views on a video is amazing. I'm going to talk about his legacy. So before Gangnam Style was released, Korean pop, K-pop, had a viewership of about two billion. Now it's around seven billion. Before, about 60% of the viewership was uh, within Asia, and now the majority is outside of Asia, with over 91% outside of South Korea. Uh, for a language where about 80 million people in the world uh, speak it, and 25 million of that is in North Korea, which has the lowest internet penetration globally, um, it's really amazing the phenomena that South Korea has achieved, and that K-pop is now a $5 billion industry. Historically, language has been a barrier to cultural exchange, uh, especially for countries where English, French, and Spanish are not spoken. Uh, and it's with this example with Gangnam Style where we learn the fourth lesson of how fans are reshaping media. Fans blur borders. They're able to watch content, or creators are able to make content that is, ex is, ex is accessible from anywhere in the world. That is how uh, the French gymnastics movement of parkour was able to be featured in James Bond films. Uh, it's how uh, Filipina singer Charisse was invited to be on Oprah and told she's the most talented woman in the world. And it's how Swedish gamer PewDiePie has single-handedly 
uh, created the most popular channel on YouTube in the world with 25 million subscribers. I've talked to you a lot today about how creators have, uh, with purpose, started creating content to pursue passions that a fan base also shares that same passion. And we know that successful large brands also have a purpose and also, I think I'm missing a slide. I'll talk to it. Also have a purpose and also have a passion. Uh, so Nike, for example, just do it uh, to inspire the human spirit uh, or Virgin, for example, is to challenge unfair status quo. So there are large brands that also have a purpose and also have a passion that want to communicate it to a fan base. And this fan base wants to consume content according to passions. They want content um, that inspires them, content that excites them, that educates them, that challenges them, content with purpose. And that is the power of YouTube, and that is the power of a fan base. Fans ignore time slots. They become talent, they pay tribute, and they blur borders. And so the opportunities are there for brands, and the power of choice is within brand marketers' hands to be able to take that purpose uh, and create content that pursues passions for fans wherever they are globally. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, do we have a question or two for Jen? Um, do you guys want to ask a question? Uh, Rosianna, do you want to ask a question about old media terms and terms you might want to use? Yeah, I'm just really curious about the shift you said from audience to fans, because I feel like to me that's kind of incorrect in the sense that they're both old media terms. Um, they're both, it's a shift from terms we used to talk about television and film to terms we used to talk about entertainers, rather than, I think, community. And that's the big one. Like, that's the big term that we're using. And fandom is also different from fans, I think. So it's, there's like a nuance there still. So I think that if we use the word fans, sometimes we use old media approaches. I would not challenge that at all. I would absolutely, absolutely invite that, that YouTube is part of a community. In fact, that the video that we opened up with is One Click, One Community is the name of the video. So yeah, I absolutely agree that it is an evolution from audience to fans and then uh, community as well. And hopefully brands can get to the point where they also have that community the same way you guys do. Um, maybe one more. Hello, I'm, I'm Alex, I'm from Wimbledon. Um, I wondered how important live content is to YouTube and to the YouTube community. It's a really great question. So um, I would say live content can play a really important role by making a moment that is often restricted to one specific audience in a room um, accessible to anyone. So it helps the fans blur borders uh, lesson that I had pointed up. So the Wimbledon live streaming is a really great example. Another great example is Samsung's unboxing uh, live stream that they do. Um, so in the S4, uh, Galaxy S4 unboxing, we saw what, that was their first moment where they live streamed such an event that was really huge in the tech community. Uh, so unboxing and showcasing the new gadgets, uh, where historically they had only done it in a room at their uh, announcement of their phone to anywhere between 200 and 2,000 people, depending on the event. Um, but for Samsung specifically, they were able, it was really important for them to be the voice of the unboxing versus um, other people like uh, YouTube talent, for example, showing the unboxing. They wanted to make sure that they controlled the brand message and the way that the phone was uh, revealed to their consumers or potential consumers on the world, around the world. So in that case, I think it's really important in order to um, help reach the right audience uh, and make sure you tell the right message uh, when generally it would be limited around a certain room or a certain borders. Um, I have a, just a question for the audience, just out of curiosity. Uh, besides, of course, our panel in the front, how many of you have your own YouTube channel? Um, do any of you have a specific question or comment? Need a tip? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Thanks. Um, I, I started my channel when I went traveling just to capture some videos and share them with, with friends and I guess show off um, of all the gl glorious places I found myself. And I, you know, I haven't really used it since 2009, but I still get comments. I still get people visiting it. And, and I think that's the state that the point I would want to make is that, you know, your, your content doesn't just last for the life of your, of your campaign, it actually lasts beyond that. So it's worth thinking about what, you know, how, not just how sticky it is, but what, what's the shelf life as well? And is it something that can keep being used? So yeah, that's pretty much it. Another comment I have on that as well is that um, some brands still think of TV ads um, and even only get resources and copyright for the time of the TV ad. And we had that um, at work, we realized that one video was really, really successful on YouTube, but actually we could only run for a year. And we took it down and then somebody else uploaded it somewhere else, of course, and got 500,000 views. And so it's, it, it is an interesting consideration for brands. Yeah, absolutely. I've come across this discussion before on uh, rights of talent. Um, so it is something to keep in mind as you're shifting digital, for sure. Okay, I think we can do one more question because while we're making the tech all work. Religion, Anyone want to do a rap battle? <laughs> okay. It's going old school. There used to be a sort of a, a maxim, you know, that 100 people, 1% one, one, 1 creates, 10% comments, and the rest just view. What, what's your rule of thumb at the moment on, on that sort of split between creators, commenters, and, and viewers? How many people create content versus yeah. comment on content versus yeah. view just content? How much has it changed? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I mentioned we have about 1 million creators across the globe on YouTube, and we have 1 billion viewers, so that gives you size and some ratios. Um, I mean, I'm not sure when you heard that stat before, but it's interesting because not all the comments will live on YouTube because they're shared throughout other media platforms as well, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. Um, so I'm not really sure if there is a, frankly, oh, like accessible or public statistic on that. But good question. Okay, thank you so much. That was yeah, wonderful. Thanks.